Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about something from calculus that you may or may not remember from way back <clears throat> in the nineties or something. Uh, and it's it's this problem. You have a you have a rational function, and you have to go. Um, compute its integral. And I'm not going to compute the integral. And I don't know if you remember how uh, to do this, but the way to do this, um, the, well, the first step was to make sure that the numerator had smaller degree than the denominator. The second step was to was to do partial fraction decomposition and partial fraction decomposition was, was this thing where you were told that you could decompose uh let's say a square here you could take whatever rational function and set up this nasty system of equations that went like this um you had in the denominators, you had all the factors of the denominator. Um, and then when you, so you have all the factors and then you have all the powers up to the one appearing in your original fraction. So you have a two here, it means you have a two here. Um, having a two here, you have uh, two because there's a two in the other side. And then there were some unknowns here. And you had some unknown polynomials in the numerator. And, but you know, you were told, you were told the degree because um, you were told that the degree is one less of the degree of the numerator. Well, the degree of the denominator without um, without the power. Um, and this is ignoring the exponent. And then, so that was that was step two, and I skipped step one, but step three. Or maybe step one to doing this. Step three was solve the equations. For so there's what uh, seven letters here, a through g. So you had to multiply everything out, clear the denominators. Um, equate coefficients, probably plug in x equals zero and negative one to see if you can, if it helps. I would plug in x equals three i as well. Um, although you didn't know what complex numbers then. Um, and then step, step four was, um, we are supposed to know how to solve each integral. And it's sort of a thing, you know, you, you learn at that moment and then you forget forever. Um, I'm not going to talk about, inter I, I'm not actually talking about integrals today. It's just, um, I'm just going to talk about the algebra happening along the way. So this is, you know, step four is true if we, if we happen to just have studied for a talk to exam. So, uh, so the thing is, when you took Calc two, you were told that um, you were told that this was going to just work. Um, and the question, the question is, the question is why? Uh, could it be? Could it be that it always works, or could it be 
and even a way an answer that is way more fun is that it doesn't actually always work and you're just only given integrals in clock two that will happen to work out and then you know leave you in the well with integrals that won't work uh so i guess is this the question does this always work you have some system of equations and you probably know that systems of equations have no reason to have solutions uh like the system a equals zero and a equals one um so i'm gonna tell you today that the answer is yes this always works um there's even there's even a unique solution which is probably not surprising since you never got two different solutions in got to well you did because the computations were hard but not two correct solutions so um the theorem that i want to talk about is that every rational function can be decomposed into partial fractions. So, uh, so that's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> let me let me write the theorem uh, carefully. Take two polynomials. Uh, well, I guess let K be a field. Of course, we would just take K to be the reals. Then there exists um, something. So, no, wait, I need to factor G. Whoa. Let G equal to P1 to the N1 times P R to the N R, where P1, blah, 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 P R are reducible. Then there exist polynomials such that, uh, well, there, there exists a partial fraction decomposition, which if I write the, um, I mean, in general, it's a whole mess, right? So F over G, this is, a, this is an element in the field of fractions of, of the polynomial ring, which as you know, is the field of rational functions. Now you know all fields of fractions. So. so what you have is you have all the denominators. So you have P1 to the one, P1 to the two, with the exponents going all the way to the original one you see in G. And then you have the same for the P2s, blah, blah, blah. And then all the way to the PRs. um and the and the numerators let's do the unknowns in blue so there's h11 h12 h1 and 1 h21 blah 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 h r and r so if i write h i j i means the denominator is p i So if I write H53, this appears with the denominator P5 to the third. Um, so the first number is which what prime in this list I'm taking, and the second number is the exponent uh, to which the prime, that prime appears. So there's a bunch of polynomials uh, and they need to have, oh, oh, a bunch of polynomials and one more. Um, there's, uh, what letter do I use? H, capital H. So there's one that just has the denominator one. 
and the degree of H I J is smaller than the degree of P I. So that's uh, well, that's the theorem. That's what partial fractions say. Probably, probably don't write it in like this in clock two, just because letters are scary. Um, but you know, with an example, f divided by x x minus one squared x squared plus three equals um, some polynomial, and then there's h1 divided by x, h21 divided by x minus 1, h22 divided by x minus 1 squared. So you have all the denominators appearing and all the and a numerator for each of those, and one for each power as well. Uh, these have degree 0. This one has degree the most one. I guess could be they could be the zero polynomial. <clears throat> and an H should have any the capital H could, could have any degree. Um and also I mean there's a thing there's the promise that if you're doing this over the reals then the reducible factors only have degree one or two which is the content of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I bet you don't know a proof for that. Maybe, maybe that should be my my last extra, extra lecture. Anyway, that's the theorem, and and we're gonna go prove it with um, because it's the proof is about the stuff we already know. Uh, oh. Ooh. I didn't finish seeing the theorem. The theorem also says that um, the the H's are uniquely determined. Which honestly, just knowing that they exist, if you think about what this is saying. If you think of this as, if you think of the system of equations, these degrees are chosen. For example, f here, say this h doesn't appear. f is going to have degree of most one, two, three, four, five. And here there's one, two, three, four, five uh, unknowns. Uh, and if you have the same number of unknowns as you have uh, equations, which you're going to have. Um, there are, um, if you have a solution for every number, you have a unique solution for every number. That's just stuff about linear equations. But anyway, who cares about the uniqueness? Because the thing, the thing is being able to do the integral. So as long as you have one solution, you do uniqueness by, by taking the integral. Whoa, that would be, that would be tough. Okay. Um, so that's the theorem. Let's let's start just proving it. Um, so what we do is we go sort of step by step. Um, so and the, the the proof I'm gonna give is just showing that it exists. In the end, what I would do to solve this is just I mean I would ask the computer honestly. You go to Wolfram Alpha and write partial fractions, and it will do it, I bet. But if I really wanted to do this problem, I would just write the, the linear equations. Um, but I'm going to prove that I would always arrive at an answer. So, step one. Uh, so, always a case of field. And I guess I have two polynomials. And the denominator is not zero, because that would be silly. Um, step one is um, we can write f divided by g as f1 plus f2 divided by g. 
where f1 all the row polynomials and furthermore the degree of f2 is the most degree of g so this is what you do in cog2 um and and we can do this in a unique way so f1 and f2 are uniquely there's only a pair of polynomials that would solve this. So that's step one. And you know the answer to this, if you remember how you did this in cog, in cog two, the answer was long division. Um, so, anything, anything I write about fractions is really about polynomials, if I just clear denominators. What I mean, clearing multiplying by g, is that I'm trying to find f1 and f2 fitting into here. With well, I mean that's uh, that's what division looks like. You have that's the division of f by g. Um, f by g is some polynomial, and times g, which is the quotient, and whatever is left over is the remainder. And the requirement is exactly that the remainder has smaller degree than the denominator. So we know, so F1 is the quotient of the long division. And F2 is the remainder. And we've already shown sort of on the first or second week of class that these are uniquely chosen. Uniquely determined. The, the long division problem only has one answer in a, in a domain such as can I join X. So, so that's it. Um, this is how you would solve this back in your, um, in your youth. So, um, so this takes care of the polynomial part. Uh, so what I can really just do from now on is try to uh, find this decomposition, assuming that the degree is smaller, which is the, the part with meat in it. Um, so, From now on, we assume that the degree of f is smaller than the degree of g. So um, step two, there's three steps. So we're 33% done. Uh, so I'm trying to take the denominator and split it into factors. So I'm gonna go split it into uh, not irreducible factors, but the factors which are powers of irreducible. And, and try to write um, F divided by D. So by the way, to remind you, from now on, the degree of f is smaller than the degree of g, forever. <clears throat> so what I want to do now is go like this. Split one fraction into a lot of fractions, um, each with denominator. Uh, one of the powers of any reducible thing, which I'm assuming are all different. Otherwise, why, why are you writing it like that? Um, so the way you do this, if I'm splitting G into R many pieces, what you do is you take, you split it into two pieces and then whatever you have left, you keep splitting until you until you you're done right if you want to 
if you have an asparagus and you want to chop it into seven pieces, you take your knife and you chop six times. You don't take six knives and go, <coughs> that would be pretty cool. But um, you don't have that many fingers. <clears throat> so um, say that G is G1 times G2 and the and they're mutually block, um, prime. Remember that the polynomial ring is a PID, it's a U of D, so the notion of GCD makes sense. Um, in this case, um, I can split F into the two denominators. Is this clear if you if you think of fractions with integers? That like, I know it's not clear, but it's, it's very similar. Um, and you can do this um, uniquely if the degree of each of the numerators is smaller than the degree of each of the denominators. So each is smaller than the one below it. Um, if there were like the real one and four, you would have zero and three. <clears throat> so, um, so let's prove this. What am I trying to do? Um, I'm trying to write, so let's start by writing one divided by G as um, in this way. So what I'm, by the way, G is G1, G2. So just like before, I mean, the trick to everything is to, uh, is to uh, clear the denominators and think of what happens with polynomials. So if I clear the denominators, the denominator on the left is is the product of the denominators on the right. So um, multiplying by g is the same as multiplying by g1, g2. So I guess what I have here is um, f1, g2 plus f2, g1. So remember that the Fs are the unknowns here. So do there exist F1 and F2 satisfying that identity? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, this is Bazoo's identity. Or because the polynomial ring is a PID even. But this is identity says you can take G1 and G2 and write their GCD, which is one, as a linear combination of G1 and G2. Um, so I can write one divided by G in this way. I guess if I wanted to write F, any any F, I guess maybe I should call this like with S. Any F can be written in this way. Just multiply both sides by Multiplying by f. So I can. So there you go. The the question, I guess. Um, so I'm not done because um, I didn't see anything about the degree. So just dividing by g, I have that f is something divided by g one and then something else divided by D2. But these probably are not gonna have uh, the correct degrees. So um, let's say, let's just rewrite this as, I don't know, H1, H2. So uh, here's where we are. F, any F divided by G splits in this way. 
uh, the degree of F is smaller than the degree of G, and the GCD of those two denominators is one. <clears throat> um, and so far I have this, this formula that I wanted, but I don't know that the degree of the numerators are smaller than the degrees of the denominators. But um, it's a fraction, I know what to do with the fraction. Um, to doing uh, polynomial division, we have that, so we divide h i by g i, so h i means h1 or g1 or h2. You divide each numerator by each denominator, you have a quotient, which I'm gonna call f plus a remainder. No, sorry, the quotient I'm gonna call q, the remainder is f. And and this means that h i divided by g i, this is what exactly what I did before, is a polynomial plus the fraction that I want now, where now the degree of h f is more than the degree of h g. So I have that f divided by g is f1 divided by g1 plus blah, blah, blah. F2 divided by G2 plus a polynomial. Let's call it Q0. Q0 is the sum of Q1 plus Q2, if you follow this computation. And I have what I want, that the degree of each numerator is more than the degree of each denominator. But I have that annoying polynomial. Um, there. Um, could it be? Could it be that it's just zero? Um, yes, it is. It is just zero. So if I I keep on doing the thing where I, I multiply by the denominator. So if I multiply by g, which is g one g two. I have this whole thing. And now, uh, the degree of this is smaller than the degree of G. The degree of this is the degree of F1 plus the degree of G2, which guess what? It's uh, smaller than the degree of G1 plus the degree of G2. Essentially, I'm saying this, all these fractions, I don't know, I don't know if I have, rational functions don't really have a degree, or maybe they do, I don't know, but if they do, the degree of everything here is negative, so when I multiply by g, the degree is less than the degree of g. Um, so this has degree smaller than the degree of g. And this one is just the same. Everything on side has the degree of most of the degree of G. No, not most, strictly smaller. This, unless Q0 is zero, has bigger degree. Or bigger than or equal, to be a constant. And that is impossible, right? If you think of a sum of polynomials, uh, on the basically on the right you have a polynomial which has to have big degree because nothing's going to cancel with the leading term of this thing. On the right, you have no leading term. The leading term is zero at that degree. Um, if G had degree three, there would be X cubes on the right, but this has no X cubes to cancel with that. And this has no X cubes. So that makes no sense. Um, so Q zero is zero. There you go. Um, so, so that's it. <clears throat>
that's why we can split the polynomial into two. Um, let's see, let's see the uniqueness. Or maybe let's recap. Um, so if the degree of F is smaller than the degree of G and G splits into two mutually prime things. F divided by G is the sum of F1 divided by G1, F2 divided by G2, where F1, the degree of all the numerators is smaller than the degree of all the denominators. So uniqueness would say, suppose that F divided by G can be written in one way, but also it can be written in another way. Uh, in this case, can we have that, do we have that the Fs are the Hs? Given that the degree, of course, the degree would have to be smaller. Um, and the answer, the answer is that yes, this is unique. Um, if you look at this at this equality, this is telling you that f one minus h one plus f two minus h two divided by g two is zero. So I really just want to show that those two fractions are zero. And I mean, think about rational numbers. It just if I have something over three plus something over four is zero, and then and the numerators are smaller than three and four, there's no solution there. Um, and that's what's happening here. So uh, let's say f1 divided by g1 plus capital f2 divided by g2 is zero. And the degree of each of the numerators is still not bigger than the degree of the denominator. You add things of degree two, you don't get higher degree. Right? So uh, the question now I have is, does this mean that F1 and F2 are all, that they're both zero? And the answer is yes. Um, F1, this means that F1 G2 plus G1 F2 is zero, clear in denominators. And one way to, I could just say that this, this polynomial is, the same. And now this looks interesting. Um, this looks false because what I have here is that F1 G2 is a common multiple of G1 and G2. Now, this makes no sense because it has it has the degree is too small. The degree is too small. I know what the the least common multiple is. Um, the the greatest common divisor of G one and G two is one. That means that when you write them, split them into reducibles, they're completely disjoint. No no reducible appears in both polynomials. Uh, so how do you get the least common multiple? Clearly, you need to you need to multiply them. To get the multi the to get all the primes that appear in both, this is the same as with numbers. Um, if you you know you know that five and seven are multi, are mutually prime, so the the least common multiple has to be the product. Otherwise, how are you going to be a multiple of five and of seven? So um, so very 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 strongly using that we have a UFD because I'm, I'm talking about splitting things into primes. Uh, what you have is that the degree of F1 G2 is the degree of F1 plus the degree of G2, which is smaller than the degree of G1 plus the degree of G2. And this is a contradiction. Uh, 
plus. Unless they're zero. Like, I guess I shouldn't say contradiction. Um, this all works out if F1 and F2 are zero, because there is, I mean, there is a common multiple of G1 and G2 that has smaller degree than the least common multiple and it's zero. Uh, just like there is a multiple of five and seven that is smaller than 35 in absolute value and that's zero. Um, all right, so there you go, that's the uniqueness. So, um, so now we can complete step two, which was, which is uh, most definitely the trickiest step of all, of, of all three. Um, so I have that degree of f is smaller than the degree of g. Then I have that f divided by g, and g is some product like this. Is something g1 to the n1, blah, 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 f r to the n, g r to the n, no. g is, I'm calling them p is p. So, um, like I said, I wanna I wanna chop the the vegetable into seven pieces. What I do is I make seven cuts in there. Uh, I make six cuts in there. S divided by G is something divided by this thing plus. Um, I'm just gonna write a question mark here. I don't care what it is. What I know is that these two have are mutually prime because they're just different irreducibles. And this one has degree smaller than the degree of P1 to the N1. And this one has degree smaller than the degree of the denominator. So whenever the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, I can I can apply the same lemma we just showed, which is if you have a fraction, you can split it as a sum with mutually uh, prime device, mutually sorry, mutually prime denominators. So you leave the first um, the first term as is, and then you split off p two to the n two. And then this thing starts with P3. And then you know how this goes, or you know, my induction. Um, keep going. Repeat this R minus one times. You will get to splitting it in all the different ways. And I mean, kind of sloppy here with the uniqueness, but basically, in each step, it's clear what we had to do. So you could get back the uniqueness from there or just use the linear algebra argument that F has, if F has degree seven, there's seven unknowns in there and there are seven equations. Um, you can you can, you can can verify that yourself. And if it works for every F, that means it has to work uniquely for every F. Or you could take this equation and clear the denominator and look at the least common multiple again. That would work as well. Either way, um, I'm done with step two. So, so far, if I have my the example I was looking at or something similar, What I know is that I can split it with x cubed in here and x minus one squared over here and x squared plus three over there. So um, not quite the partial fractions that we know and most definitely love. Uh, there's the, the remaining step, step three, 
is to take this stuff or this stuff and split it um, split it into things uh, that have constant numerator. So step three is easier than step two, but harder than step one. You take f divided by p to the n, where p is irreducible. And the degree of f is smaller than the degree of p to the n, which I guess is the n times the degree of p. Uh, and we need to be able to write this as f divided by p to the n equals uh, f1 divided by p to the 1, f2 divided by p to the 2, all the way to fn divided by p to the n. Obviously, you can do this. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, I didn't turn the slide. All right. Okay, step three. <laughs> Oops. Um, so, we, what we have, no, never mind, we're fine. So I, sp I split it into stuff where the denominator is a power of an irreducible. So that's what I have here. S something of smaller degree than the denominator, the denominator is the, the, the power of an irreducible thing. What I wanna do to, to finish my partial fractions um, symphony is split this into a sum where I, what, what appear here are all the different powers up to the one that originally appeared. So what I did so far, obviously you can do, just make this zero, 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 make this one equal to F. But the trick is that that's not what I wanna do. Uh, I wanna make the degree of all of these smaller than the degree of P. So before we had X cubed in the denominator, F could have degree two. Now I have X, X squared, blah, 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 X cubed. Everything here has a zero, they're all constants. So if you have X cubed, it's pretty clear how to do this. Um, but I guess, I mean, the thing is, P could be reducible or where any field, who knows what degree it has. Um, even if it's degree two, this, right, right. So step three. Uh, and, the yeah, FIs are, are uniquely determined again. So, um, <clears throat> so here we go. Uh, what we want to do is take this equation uh, that we want and I wanna go, I wanna multiply, I wanna clear the denominators. So F is gonna be F1 P to the M minus one plus F2 P to the M minus two, all the way to, I multiply by P to the N, so the last thing actually has no denominator. Um, so what does this look like? Um, it looks familiar to me. Um, It reminds me of this equation. Um, you know how you can take any number and write it as something times a power of 10 and something else times a power of another power of 10. Uh, and then the powers of 10 keep decreasing. And the thing is all these numbers um, are smaller than 10. And if you've ever seen uh, other bases like base two, I guess you could always go, you could do this um, for every number, right? Um, so do you think I can do this in my head? I probably can't. Um, two to the uh, 10, I have, ah, I don't know, let's just pause the recording. I'm gonna pause the recording and pretend I was super, Actually, that took two seconds because I didn't do it. I just Googled it. Um, so the number 
that it, it gave me was this one. So 2 to the 8, and then there's 1 times 2 to the 7. So the numbers that go with the powers of 2 are, are all smaller than 2, which means which makes them 0 or 1. Um, and then we have decreasing powers of 2 all the way. And the thing about 1729 is that it's smaller than 2 to the 11. All right. Um, so, so the thing is, I don't know if you've ever seen how to uh, how to convert a, a number to binary, but we're going to do the same thing. Uh, take f. What you do is, so this is the analogy to keep in mind where I would come up with this, but the answer to what you do is divide f by p and you will get f equals i'm going to say q1 times p plus fn and this is the remainder maybe i need another slide for this um so what i want is for this to equal some sort of sequence here. No, this was F1. F1, P to the N minus one. F2, P to the N minus two. So divide F by P, you will get F equals quotient times P plus the remainder, which I'm gonna call Fn. So Fn has the real most degree of P, which is exactly what it wants. Now, what do I what do I do? Um, I divide 1729 by two, I got one. And then I what I do is take the quotient. The quotient is the, the left half of the number. Or maybe divide by 10, you get remainder nine and you get uh, quotient 172, and then you keep going. Divide Q1, Q1 by P. So F is going to be Q2 times P plus Fn minus 1, P plus Fn. So this is the result of dividing Q1 by P. This would make it Q2 P squared plus F n minus one P plus F n. And again, I'm dividing by P. So this has the degree of most degree of P. And then keep going until you're done. Um, the Qs, the, the degree keeps decreasing because we're always dividing by P. They decrease by at least the decrease by exactly the degree of p each time. There's my phone dying. Um, so it's going to finish. And at the end, what do you have? Maybe I'll do one more step. What you have is you divide q by q by p, and you have q3 times p plus the remainder, which I'm going to call it n minus 2. There's a p squared that was already there. And this I'm not touching either. What you have is Q3 P to the third plus Fn minus two P squared. And once you're done, what you will have, count, count the degrees, you will have F0 P to the N minus one, blah, 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 Fn. Um, the degree of this one is the degree of F. Uh, and that's where you, so you know that, um, that we're done before we reach PN.
because because it has larger degree. So uh, so I'm done basically. I have that F is uh yeah, which is which F zero P M minus one F one P M minus two all the way to F N and then you divide by P to the N, you have that the fraction you're interested in is F0 divided by P, F1 divided by P squared, blah, 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 blah. Fn divided by P to the N. F -n -n. Did I count wrong? I might have counted no, wrong. <clears throat> anyway, um, so we're, we're, we're done. Uh, so that is why partial fractions work. Uh, I think I'm not gonna say anything else because um, I, could, I could do an example, but you've probably seen too many of those in your life. Let me do an example. Let me do an example the cool way. Or maybe maybe the way you were, we were always doing it. Uh, yeah, I wanna go to Wendy's to do that. I've never done this in my life, but I'm just very confident that it will work. X cubed um, times X minus one to the fourth times X plus three, X squared plus three. It will work. Uh, Oh, it does it over the complex numbers. Oof. Well, you take this one and the complex conjugate and you will get um, real. This one, oh, this one, here's over the reals. There you go. Um, but the thing is, I knew it would work because we did the, oh, here, no, expanded form is what you use in calculus. But now it's the denominator takes all of it's nasty. But whatever. Um, you know, you do integrals with a computer. But the thing is, we know they're going to work. That's um, so we can now we can sleep at night knowing that it will work. All right, that's all I have for you. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, follow me on stuff. I don't know. The thing, you know, the thing. Um, bye bye.